So how you guys doing? Awesome. Well, today we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Upside Down, where we're talking about the most famous sermon really in all of human history. So if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Matthew chapter 5, uh, and we're going to be going through that uh, for the next six weeks, actually. Matthew is one of the four books in the Bible called the Gospels because they tell the good news of Jesus, his life, his miracles, some of his teaching about his death and his resurrection. And as you might expect, the book of Matthew was written by a dude named Matthew, right? That was one of Jesus' 12 apostles, so he was an eyewitness for Jesus' teaching, some of his miracles. He was there when Jesus was crucified on the cross, and he was there when Jesus rose from the dead. And so he is an eyewitness. So Jesus' longest recorded sermon in all the Bible is in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And it's often called the, the Sermon on the Mount. And in those words, Jesus is, for the first time that we read, laying out a full sermon. And, you know, I told Chris before we got started, I'm like, I am so excited about for the next six weeks spending time preaching through this Sermon on the Mount, these words of Jesus. You know, we preach so often on Paul's writings, and all of that is God's word. But these are the words of Jesus. And I think about how Jesus' teaching transformed the world. And I read, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, there's a, a college in Kentucky called Ashbury College. And there's revival going on. They had their normal Wednesday morning, morning chapel. That Wednesday morning chapel is still going as we speak. People are coming in from other places to be a part of that. Preachers are flying in from around the country to see what's going on and to be a part of that. They said the stage is wet with tears as people just are crying over their sin and repenting and coming to Jesus. Jesus' words on this Sermon on the Mount turned the world upside down. And Jesus' words today can still turn the world upside down. And so I'm so excited about us talking about these upside down words of Jesus that transformed our world. Now this Sermon on the Mount was about, if you go back and you read chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew out loud, it takes about 15 minutes to get through the sermon. I know what some of you guys are thinking. If 15 minutes is good enough for Jesus, Nathan, <laughs> why, why are we here so long? This sermon was also, it was probably uh, much longer than that. In fact, a lot of uh, scholars think that it was two or three days in length. So when I get, yet, get you out of here in time to beat the Baptist to the restaurant, you're going to be thankful for that now. Jesus was still fairly early on in his ministry when he preached this Sermon on the Mount, but he had called his 12 apostles, he had already performed some miracles, and so he was getting these large crowds that were following him. And that's where we kind of pick up at the beginning of chapter 5. This is verses 1 and 2. Now Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So now you know why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's a very technical theological term. It was because he preached the sermon on the side of a small mountain. So it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And you see, he sat. So it was the tradition in that day that the Bible teacher would sit and everyone else would stand to listen to the message. So imagine standing for two or three days listening to a sermon. Unfortunately for my knees and ankles, the tradition has changed now where I stand and, and you sit. Before this sermon... No, that's all right. No, I want to walk around. <laughs> but thank you, though. I may sit on the stage if they start hurting too bad. But Jesus, before this, would preach in the synagogues. And the synagogues were the regular places where people would go to pray and to be taught Scripture. They were in the towns, and this was the traditional, like churches, church buildings today. But it's important to understand that this message of Jesus was not preached in a synagogue. It was preached on a mountain, kind of in the wilderness. And there's a reason for that. This was not a traditional message. Synagogues were the places for traditional teaching, but this was anything but traditional. This was a revolutionary message that turned so many of their thoughts upside down. It was a message that wasn't received well by the religious elite. And if we're really honest with ourselves over the next six weeks, we're going to find a little of this message upside down for us too. And we're going to find it a little offensive as some things we think we know are challenged. Jesus' message is going to challenge some of our priorities, some of our goals. In this message over the next six weeks, we're going to see that Jesus' his dream for your life isn't really the American dream. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's known as a rabbi, and a rabbi was a teacher of the law. And so these guys were really popular. They were some of the most educated people. They were very respected. 
some of the, the most popular ones were treated like celebrities. They were, they were like social media influencers. They just didn't have iPhones or, or you know, t- sneaker deals. But the rabbi's interpretation of the Old Testament was very important. And it was called his yoke. Now, where that term comes from, this idea of a yoke, is this harness thing. It's made of wood that's put around the neck and shoulders of an ox or a bull or a donkey so that you can control where they go when they're pulling a wagon or they're plowing. This is kind of what one looks like. So you can see how that's kind of, you can pull on that just like a harness today and kind of direct them where they're going. So this gives you the idea of what a yoke was for these teachers the followers of a particular rabbi, they would take on his yoke. In other words, they would allow his specific interpretation of the Old Testament to define the way they lived their life and where they went. There were a lot of different rabbis, and so there were a lot of different yokes. But what you need to understand going into this Sermon on the Mount is that the yoke of Jesus, this is his yoke, this message is where he is laying out for the first time his yoke, his interpretation. But it was so different from what they expected. Felt a little upside down, and candidly, feels a little upside down for us as well. One of the main reasons that I hear from people why they don't follow Jesus is they say that the rules in the Bible are archaic. They they seem so out of date. Well, if that's you, you ought to feel a little better knowing that they didn't like some of those rules back then either. It was rejected. This upside down nature of Jesus' teaching is less about how long ago those words were said and more about how upside down it feels to the way the world thinks and the way we so often think. So as we go through this sermon over the next six weeks, my prayer for you is that you'd take these words of Jesus to examine your own life, that you'd check and see if you need to turn some of your priorities upside down, that you need to turn some of your ideas upside down, some of your attitudes upside down, maybe even turn some of your relationships upside down. This message from Jesus should make you question the things you think you know and replace some of them with the things you learn from Jesus. This message from the Sermon on the Mount, it may even need to turn your religion upside down to understand that Christianity is not about rules, it's about relationship. We're going to see that. The Sermon on the Mount starts with nine different statements that all begin with these words, blessed are. And so Jesus will say, blessed are, and then he's going to give us a statement that sounds so upside down. This word blessed comes from a Greek word that we see called makarios. And makarios is, it literally means to be happy. But it's deeper than we think of happy. It's this sense of joy that is unassailable, that is not dependent on our circumstance. And so happy or, or joyful are, and then these statements. Now these nine statements are often called the Beatitudes. And these these are called, beatitude just means the blessing. Another way to think of this and a way to remember it is this idea, I like to say, these are beatitudes. In other words, these are the attitudes we should have. Be these attitudes as a follower of Jesus. And so as we look at these beatitudes, it's going to challenge some of the things that you think. All right, well, let's walk through this entire section called the beatitudes. This is Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see how upside down that sounds when you hear it? Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who persecuted. That doesn't feel right to us. That feels very upside down, and it would have felt very upside down for Jesus' listeners back 2,000 years ago, too. But this very first beatitude, this very first thing Jesus said, is the key to understanding the rest of the beatitudes. And I would also think, I think it's actually the most important sentence in the entire Sermon on the Mount. Look back at verse 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You want to know the secret to finding joy and happiness in this life? You want to know the secret to have an unassailable joy that is not depending on the circumstance around you? Be poor in spirit. 
It's what Jesus is saying. And so some of you heard these words, blessed are the poor, and you went, that sounds good to me, preacher, because I ought to be pretty blessed. But we don't think about poor and blessed together. We just don't. Blessed are the wealthy, right? We don't think about poor as a blessing. Wealthy and blessing go together. Think about this. When you go to a a rich Christian's house and you see their house for the first time and you walk around, you're like, wow, this is an amazing house. What do they say? We're so blessed. We put blessing and wealth together. We don't put blessing and poor together. That's upside down from our thinking. And Jesus isn't just talking about kind of poor here. He's talking about really poor. There's actually two different words in the Greek language for poor. One kind of means the working class poor. It is you, you work, you don't make quite enough money to pay all your bills, and so you're always struggling to make ends meet, and you're trying to get along. But then this word is a different kind of poor. This is destitute. This is completely bankrupt. It makes working poor look very wealthy. This is the kind of poor that it was used to describe people who lived on the street and begged for money. That's what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus isn't talking about money here. He says poor in spirit. Blessed are those that are completely bankrupt in spiritual assets. Have nothing going for them spiritually. That doesn't sound right. We want to be, we want to have it all together. We want to be blessed by having our spirituality in control just like the rest of our life is in control. We want people to think that we're spiritually rich, that we have it all together. And and we do that because we see what we think other people seem to have it all together, right? We see on social media people with their perfect families and their perfect lives all dressed up in their perfect little outfits to go to their perfect churches on Sunday. And so we put on this yoke of, I've got it all worked out. I'm spiritually rich. And and we even do that at church. And and so we come together and we greet one another and we say, how are you? Oh man, I'm awesome. We are blessed. How are you? Awesome. And on the inside, we're broken and we're hurting and we're torn apart. And yet we put on this fake yoke that we've got it all together. We, We don't see being poor in spirit as a win. Nobody puts poor in spirit on the resume, right? It's not right there with computer skills and being bilingual. There's no kids' trophies given out for being poor in spirit. Well, I mean, maybe there is today with all the participation awards. But historically, no one wants to be poor in spirit. It's not something that we pursue. And yet, this is exactly where Jesus' plan for your life begins. It starts with you being poor in spirit. So what does it look like? for you to be poor in spirit. In its most simple form, being poor in spirit is a daily desperate dependence on God. A daily desperate dependence on God. So let me ask you, is that you? Are you poor in spirit? You know, we see all of these self-help things. I I get on social media and even from Christians, I see these help, self-help things that they say, hey, you got this. You can conquer the world. You are strong. You deserve the best. But Jesus says just the opposite. What it means to be poor in spirit is, I don't have this. I can't fix this. I am weak. I don't deserve anything. That's the starting point for a right relationship with God. I don't deserve anything. I love how the the message paraphrase kind of puts this in modern language. Look, Look at what it says here, this paraphrase says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope with less of you, there is more of God in his rule. How many people long to be at the end of their rope? We don't, but this is upside down. Be poor in spirit, Jesus says. Now, some of you are thinking I'm telling you to live a life of insignificance, to not accomplish anything, to not have purpose and and to, to make things happen. But that's actually the exact opposite of what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that when you give control to God, You're going to see things happen that you never could have imagined. You're going to be able to accomplish more than you ever thought you could. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, and he's talking about God here, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties, For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He says when we are poor in spirit, when we recognize we don't have that, 
That's when God shows up and we get to see his power. You know, I've had to do this time and time again in ministry. I mean, it's not easy, and I'm not good at it. It's not my nature. But when I went into ministry when, uh, about 13 years ago, 14 years ago, I was 41 years old. And I thought, I'm too old. I'm not trained. I don't have the right education. I don't have the right background. I can't do this. And I had to get over that. I had to trust that God called me. Therefore, God's got the power to do what he needs to do. And so I was, became the teaching and executive pastor at a pretty large church. And about twice a month, I preached over 1,000 people. Not because I was ready for it. Not because I was trained for it. Not because I was capable of it. But because God called me to it. And he has the power. And when Lil and I were called to start Karis City Church about two years ago, we had to completely trust God. I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never planted a church. I'd never been a part of a church plant. You know, there's these amazing church plant organizations that they train preachers for like two years to plant a church, and then they support them financially for the first two or three years while they get things together. We didn't have any of that. We had no idea what we were doing. I joked that the next time I plant a church, I'm going to be pretty experienced as a church planter, but this time, I got no idea. We had to trust that God knows. We had to trust that God called us, and so God can make things happen. But I want to be honest with you, I'm not always very good at that. I fail in this being poor in spirit on a regular basis. I'm one of those people that I'm driven by the fear of failure. I joke that I don't care that much about winning, but boy, I hate to lose. And so a lot of times I think, this is all on me. I've got to do this. And I start to hear a voice in my head that says, you're blowing it. You're not going to do it. And there are points in time when I really struggle. When we started the church, about six months later, the the Delta variant of COVID hit, and our attendance went down dramatically. And I was really questioning, God, what what do you have me doing? And I kind of took it all on me. And there have been points where a family that's serving and giving will leave our church, and it hurts my feelings. And and I start to question what I'm doing and what I could have done different. My my comfort level and, and my confidence goes up and down sometimes with weekly attendance. Or whether the giving goes up and down. That's wrong. This isn't on me. I I need to remember, and I try to preach to myself like I'm preaching to you. I don't have this. I do not have the capability to lead this church where it goes. But I have incredible confidence that God has power. And that if I trust in God, he can do crazy, crazy cool things. And, And look, let me be honest. When I give God control, when I'm poor in spirit about this church, there's a freedom in that. Because I'm like, God, you got this. Results are on you. I'm going to do the best I can in your power. But when we see more of ourselves and less of God, when we're not at the end of our rope, so to speak, then we have a tendency to worry and to stress because it's on us. I am weak, but he is strong. That's what it means. And look at what God has done since we started as a church. We baptized nine people last year. I don't know if you appreciate how big a deal that is for a church our size. God's doing cool stuff. We've started a student ministry in the last year, and it's more than doubled in size. I laughed as I was thinking back to the beginning. Our very first meeting about a year ago, we had one kid show up. Five adults, one kid. Yep, 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 we see the one right there. It was really uncomfortable (laughs) when there's more adults. But Wednesday night, we had 13 kids show up for Wednesday night program. Yeah. Not only have we been able to financially support ourselves as a church and support the ministries of this church, but in 2022, that year, we gave away over $52,000 to outside missions and church plants. Yeah. We also gave away $4,000 to people in need. God's doing crazy cool things. We're growing. That ain't me. That ain't you. That's God doing cool stuff. There's incredible freedom in being poor in spirit because we get to turn it over to God. So what would it look like for you to be poor in spirit? What if you got up every day and got down on your knees and said, God... I can't do this. I I can't be the husband or the wife you've called me to be. I I can't be the parent my children need me to be. 
I, I can't be the man or woman that you've called me to be. I can't be the employer or the employee that I need to be. I can't do this, God, but you can. That's what it looks like, giving it over to God and being poor in spirit. And, and so here's the thing about the rest of these Beatitudes. You can't get to them if you're not poor in spirit. I, I've heard some theologians compare this to like a, a ladder. Each one of these Beatitudes is like a rung or a step on the ladder. And this being poor in spirit is the very first step or rung. You can't get to the other steps without this first one, being poor in spirit. It gives meaning to the rest of it. And it's the very foundational beginnings of what it looks like to be a true follower of Jesus. All right, look at verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How upside down is that? You know what that's literally saying? Blessed are those who are unhappy. <laughs> they will be happy by being unhappy. That's what it's saying. That's upside down. And, and the word for mourn here in the Greek is the deepest form of mourning. There's multiple types of Greek words that are used. And this is the deepest mourning. It's the kind of mourning that you mourn when someone very close to you that you love dies. And Jesus is saying, happy or blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. This is one that I've grown to understand better as I've gotten older. Let me give you some examples. A couple of weeks ago, uh, a guy I went to high school and graduated with his son, who's 20, was killed in a car wreck. He was a student at Stephen F. Austin State University riding with another kid, and uh, apparently an 18-wheeler turned in front of them, and, and they were both killed. In an instant, their family changed. And I hurt with them. I've hurt with them for two weeks. I've prayed for them almost every day. But here's the thing. I've only seen this guy I graduated from high school with about three times in 30 years. Call, at reunions, we'll run into each other, we'll talk in a group. And that's it. But even though I don't have a continuing relationship with this family, I hurt for them. I pray for them. I've sent a couple of messages to him encouraging him because I'm mourning with their family. I, I mourn with some of the couples that I counsel with that are struggling in their marriage. I, I mourn with some of you guys that are going through tough stuff in your jobs, in your finances, and with your family relationships. We've got some friends that are having big trouble with their kids and we pray for their kids every day just like we do our own. And we're hurting with them and praying for them. I'm mourning with now 28,000 people that died in Turkey and Syria in an earthquake earlier this week. Just stop for a minute and think about the magnitude of that. 28,000 people in an instant. Oh. So if 28,000 are dead, that probably means 150,000 were injured. There's probably half a million families that their world just got flipped upside down. And I've hurt with them, and I've prayed for them. See, it's a huge loss. But we can miss it because it's halfway around the world. And I think we get so focused on our own lives and our own little family group that we just mourn for the things that are close to us. But you know, here's the deal. Non-Christians do that too. Everybody mourns when somebody they love dies. Everybody mourns when their life doesn't go the way they hoped it would. What separates being those who mourn that Jesus is talking about is we hurt over a broken world that's torn apart by sin. We should mourn over the sin in our own lives. We should mourn in the, the sin and the brokenness of sin in the world around us. When we do that, we bond together with Jesus and his suffering and know that Jesus mourned over a broken world. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus weeps over the entire city of Jerusalem because he knew they weren't going to follow him and his message. And we too should weep and be broken and mourn over a world that's torn apart by sin. But here's the other part of that. When we mourn, we'll be comforted. What I've found is that I mourn with the world around me. I mourn with the people that I counsel with and friends and relatives and the more I do that, the more God heals the brokenness in our own family. Because our family isn't perfect. My wife has lupus, and it's getting progressively worse. I've got one kid that has a genetic disorder that keeps her from living a normal life. But the more I mourn with the world around me, the more I'm comforted in my own situation. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Blessed are those who mourn, because they'll be comforted. Look at verse 5. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Man, our self-reliance and our self-help yoke that we want to wear, we hate this one. 
Because meek sounds a lot like weak, even kind of rhymes. And we sure don't want to be somebody that gets run over. We don't want to be meek. But here's what meek is, if you look at the Greek word. It's strength under control. It's this perfect balance of wisdom that shows when to act and when not to act. I think about this like a powerful stallion that's been broken to do a job. Rather than running wild, still powerful, but it's trained to do a job. A meek person willingly submits to authority. They put other people's needs and wants ahead of their own. They serve other people. Think about how upside down this was for Jesus' listeners. Because they were living under Roman rule. (laughs) Think about that. The Roman, militarily, Rome had conquered the entire known world. So what would their yoke been? Might makes right. Might conquers the world. That's what they would have come with, in with. And Jesus says, the powerful won't inherit the earth. The meek will. It's a true statement. Let me, let me kind of use an example out of nature and kind of talk to you about the, the relationship between prey animals and predators. We think about wolves dominating sheep. But is that really true? There's way more sheep than there are wolves. And they get to hang out and eat grass and get taken care of. And the wolf is desperately hunting all the time trying to survive. They struggle to survive as a species. They struggle to survive as individual wolves. There's way more antelope in Africa than there are lions in Africa. And let's be honest, the lions desperately need the antelope, but the antelope don't really need the lions. It's the point. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All right, look at verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I think it's hard for us to really get our brains around what Jesus is saying here because we really never hunger or thirst. We never thirst because we can turn a water faucet on and get some water. We don't really hunger because we've got more food in our house than we can eat in the next two weeks. But Jesus' listeners would have understood what Jesus was saying because they would sometimes go hungry. When they traveled, they'd be looking for a water source, trying to find some water. And so they understood what it was like to hunger and to thirst. But Jesus is saying our quest for righteousness, our desire to be holy, should be like a hungry man looking for some food. But you know, righteousness isn't typically what we hunger for. We hunger for power and wealth and fame and authority and sexual intimacy. But Jesus turns this upside down and he says we should hunger, we should chase after righteousness like it's something to eat, like it's a drink of water that we desperately need. It should be what motivates us. We should hunger to look more like Jesus. When you think about being hungry, when you're really hungry, what you're going to do on Saturday night doesn't matter anymore. You've got to feel that need. And Jesus is saying righteousness should be that need. Look, we're never going to be sinless in this life, but we sure ought to sin less day after day because we're chasing after righteousness. Listen to how the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, who lived in the 1800s, describes someone who lives out this particular beatitude. He hungers and thirsts for righteousness. He does not hunger and thirst that his own political party may get into power, but he does hunger and thirst that righteousness may fill the land. He does not hunger and thirst that his own opinions may come to the front and that his own sect or denomination may increase in numbers and influence, but he does desire that righteousness may come to the front. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So what happens is, when we become more righteous, then we get this fulfillment from Jesus. But what does that do? Makes us hungry again. And so it's this continuous process of looking more and more like Jesus as we chase after righteousness. All right, look at verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is saying, we've been shown mercy And now we need to show mercy to other people. This goes back to that very first beatitude, poor in spirit. Because we understand our desperate need for Jesus' grace and his mercy. We we understand how much has been done for us and how much we've been forgiven of. And so it makes it easier for us to forgive and to be merciful to other people. I have people ask me all the time, you know, something terrible was done to me. How do I forgive? And the answer to that is be poor in spirit. Let me ask you, how many times have you turned away from Jesus? How many times have you put something else in your life and made it more important than Jesus? 
How many times have you done things you know Jesus doesn't want you to do? How many times have you not done things that you know Jesus wants you to do? And yet, Jesus not only forgave you of that, but knowing all those things that you've done and all those things you will do, he went to the cross so that you could be forgiven. That's how we show mercy to other people. We understand that we desperately need mercy. And it becomes easier to pass that out. But, but it's actually bigger than that because it's also saying happy will be if we have a community that's merciful to one another. The reality is if you show mercy to other people, you're more likely to get mercy back. If when people need forgiveness, you forgive them. When they need help and support in their life, when things are tough and you do that, when something goes wrong or you make a mistake, you're more likely to receive mercy back. And so when we begin to show mercy to one another as a church in a biblical community, there's happiness in that because we be, become a community that loves and supports and forgives one another. Blessed are the mercy, merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Look at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This is a promise in verse 8. Jesus is saying, if you're pure in heart, you'll get to see God. Now, he's not talking about in heaven one day. You will get to see God then. But he's talking about having a better understanding of who God is right now and having a closer relationship with Jesus. The pure in heart get to see the power of God. I'm going to be honest. There are going to be some people, some Christians that make it into heaven like somebody running out of a burning building with the flames licking behind them and you know, a little smoke coming off their back. And that's true, but they're not going to never get the joy of having a close relationship with Jesus in this life. See, when our lives are filled with the sins of idolatry, of chasing after the things of this world, and pride, and arrogance, and lust, we're not going to have a close relationship with Jesus. But the pure in heart see God. They see the power of God around them. They feel the power of God in their own lives. They see God in a sunset or a sunrise. They, they see God in the words of the Bible. They see God working in their church. They see God working in their community. They get to be a part of that. They are confident that God has the power to answer their prayers. Listen to how James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this. He says this in James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Notice he doesn't say the power of a, the prayer of a Christian is powerful and effective. He says the power of a righteous person. There's a difference. Someone that's chasing after God. There's power in that. There's a connection between that person and God, and there's power in that. So let me ask you a question. How often do you really feel God in here? How often do you see God working around you? And maybe if you don't, that's because you're chasing after the things of this world and not the things of God. All right, look at verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, this is saying that we follow the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he is giving us this obligation to carry that out, to bring about restoration and reconciliation. Now, the Bible at one place says we're ambassadors of reconciliation. And that means more than just living a peaceful life. It means actively working to bring about peace. So we encourage our friends who are struggling in their marriage. We get involved and we offer words of encouragement and prayer to families that are having a hard time getting along or church members that are having a hard time getting along or friends or coworkers. We involve ourselves to reconcile those people because we are ambassadors of peace. But it also means that we share our faith with others so that they can be reconciled with God. Because you can't have peace with God until you submit to Jesus and his authority. And, and so we're helping bring peace in that way as well. That's what being a peacemaker means. But here's what being a peacemaker doesn't mean. Being a peacemaker does not mean overlooking the sin in your own life, or overlooking sin in this church, or overlooking sin in our community to have peace. I, I think it's very intentional that Jesus put this beatitude right behind the one that says, pure in heart. Because he wanted us to understand that pure in heart is important and we don't have peace by ignoring evil in our world. Being a peacemaker doesn't mean that we don't speak truth. It doesn't mean that we don't speak out and fight against evils like prejudice and hatred and racism and violence. People wanting to hurt the helpless or the unborn. 
Our peacemaking comes out of a desire to bring glory to God by seeing restoration and healing around us, not by ignoring sin, by our lack of action and courage. All right, this last beatitude in verses 10 through 12, it may be the most upside down of all, and it's the most difficult to achieve. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How upside down is that? Blessed or happy are you when you're persecuted. And it goes further than that. It says rejoice and be glad. The Greek word that's used there gives this idea of jumping up and down for joy when you're persecuted. Well, that doesn't feel right. It feels very upside down, and it would have felt very upside down to Jesus' listeners. But see, here's the thing. It didn't take long for persecution of that early Christian church to start. Jesus' apostles would be beaten. They'd be jailed. Almost all of them would be killed for their faith. And one of the early churches that was very successful was a church in a place called Smyrna. And the pastor there was a guy named Polycarp. And Polycarp had been the pastor now for a, a, a number of years. And when the Romans came in and they found out that he was preaching and teaching Jesus, they arrested him. They tried him for being a preacher of Jesus. They convicted him and sentenced him to death because he was saying that the only God is Jesus, not the Roman emperor. But because Polycarp was very popular in the community, they gave him a way out. They said, look, if you'll just, if you'll just say you don't follow Jesus and you'll bow down to the Roman emperor, we'll let you off the hook. But that's the offer they gave him. But here's how Polycarp responded. 86 years I've served Jesus, and he never did me any injury. How then can I betray my king and savior? And so the Romans threatened to burn him at the stake if he didn't reject Jesus. But Polycarp replied, You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and after a little while is extinguished. Why tarry? Bring what you will. So Polycarp, he was tied to a stake and wood was piled around him and the wood was let on fire. And, and as the fire began to creep towards him, he began to pray. But, but he didn't pray that he would be rescued. He didn't pray for judgment against the people that had done this to him. Instead, here was his prayer. Oh, Lord God Almighty, I give you thanks that you've counted me worthy of this day and this hour, that I should be counted among the martyrs. Blessed are you who are persecuted for your faith, for great is your reward in heaven. See, we're so fortunate in the United States that the risks and the costs for us in following Jesus are so small. Other places around the world, there are people that are separated from their families for following Jesus, arrested, beaten even killed. Do you know that almost 6,000 people were killed for their faith around the world in 2022? That was an increase of 20% from the year before. The world isn't getting better for Christians. Last year, over 5,000 churches were destroyed. Over 6,000 Christians were arrested. And over 4,000 were kidnapped for worshiping Jesus. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for great is their reward. You know, in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, 8 through 18, the Apostle Paul is offering some encouragement to the persecuted church. And he's going to tell them it's coming, to be prepared for it, but he's, he's encouraging them in this. And I want to ask us to do something a little different today. I want to I get you to just go ahead, if you would, and stand up. And we're going to read this section together. We're going to read a passage of this together. And as we read these words of encouragement from Paul to the persecuted church, I want us to hurt I want us to mourn with our brothers and sisters around the world, and I want us to pray for them and stand in solidarity and union with the Christians around the world who are being persecuted. Let's read this together. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. For our light and momentary troubles... You can sit back down. We shouldn't be upset when somebody gets mad at us when we share our faith or we offer to pray with them. Jesus says we should jump for joy, that we're counted to make that little sacrifice. And here's the reality. Them getting mad at you is really unlikely anyway, but it scares us to death. 
while our brothers and sisters in other places are dying to follow Jesus. Blessed are those who are persecuted. We should jump for joy when we get the opportunity. But, but do you see how upside down this yoke that Jesus is offering, how different it is from the world? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted. You can understand why people back then didn't love the message. And so many people today don't love the message. These beatitudes, they're like a ladder. Start with poor in spirit and you climb each one as you grow in your relationship with Jesus to hopefully you get to the point where you can actually celebrate when you're persecuted. So as we wrap up today, let me ask you, what yoke are you wearing? Are you still wearing the yoke of self-help or self-reliance or the American dream? Or are you wearing this upside down yoke that Jesus offers? What we do in this life rings into eternity. And ultimately in eternity, the only thing that is going to matter is how you share Jesus' love and his message of hope for a lost world. It won't matter how much money you made. It won't matter how successful you were at your job. It won't matter how much stuff you acquired. It will only matter, did you follow Jesus and did you live out his upside-down message? Let's pray.